All right. Well, good morning. good morning. I hope you are doing well. It is an honor and privilege to be here. When Dr. Groza uh, reached out for me to uh, possibly come and preach uh, today in chapel, it was a quick yes, mainly because uh, Kelsey and I are ser- this is serving as a date day. We have four kids that are back home, and we're going to spend the day after this. We're going to go probably down to Cal Baptist to our old stomping grounds and enjoy uh, some time together. Uh, I was asked this morning to preach on Hebrews chapter 11. As I understand, you are uh, in the midst of a series on difficult passages of Scripture, and Hebrews chapter 6 certainly fits that bill. It's in that category. Chuck Swindoll said of this passage, he called it the Rubik's Cube of the Bible. He said, no matter which way you turn it or twist it, it never seems to quite fit one interpretation. It's one of the most debated passages in all of the Word of God, and it's one of the dividing lines in soteriology between Arminianism and Calvinism. And the question at the heart of this passage is, can a person fall away? That's the language used in Hebrews 6. Can a person fall away and lose the gift of salvation that God has given them? I want us to read, beginning in verse number 6, verse number 4, rather, of Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, at face value, at surface level, it seems like this is a troubling passage for those of us who believe in the security of the believer. That Christ holds us, that when God gives us a new nature, that we keep that new nature. That once a person is born again, they remain born again. Now, some have called our position, once saved, always saved. I think perhaps a better term would be, if saved, always saved. Now, there are dozens of interpretations concerning the passage we're looking at. We don't have time, and I would bore you to death if I went through all of the possible interpretations. I want to focus in on three possible interpretations, or maybe popular, I guess you could say, interpretations of this text. Some believe this is a warning for believers to not lose their salvation. Some believe that this passage teaches that a person can fall away from the grace of God. That that it's referring to people who are genuinely saved, yet they lose their salvation. Now, I think we've all met people who profess faith in Christ and only to walk away from the faith. Now, some believe those people who walked away from the faith were actual, genuine believers in Christ, and then they fell away. They lost their salvation. Now, there's a lot of reasons that belief and that understanding is faulty. Now, the main reason I believe that understanding of this text is faulty is because Scripture is clear that we're saved by God's grace and we're given everlasting life that can never be taken away. Now, we should always read the few obscure passages in God's Word in light of the many clear passages in God's Word. God's word as a whole makes it very clear that God saves us and then God keeps us. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's all glory to God. Now, there are so many passages we could look at, uh, passages that come to mind, John chapter 6, John chapter 10, Romans chapter 8, dozens and dozens of passages that come to mind. I want to look at just one verse very quickly and we'll move on. John chapter 5, verse 24. It says, most assuredly, Jesus said, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has what? Everlasting life, eternal life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now, the person who believes in Jesus, he says, has everlasting life. Now, Jesus didn't give a qualifier here, right? There's no fine print here that negates his promise. He he means exactly what he says. If a person can receive Christ and be given eternal life only to mess up and have it taken away, it it wasn't eternal, was it? It wasn't everlasting. It would be better termed temporary life. Now, 
Let's say a person, they come to faith in Christ and they last three years, but at some point they do something drastic that they fall away. Now, if they lost their salvation, then Jesus gave them three-year life, not everlasting life. There's no qualifier here. He also says that the person shall not come into judgment. They pass from death into life. Once again, there's no qualifier. He doesn't say, well, you're not going to fall into judgment unless you do something really bad. Then I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to judge you. No, no, no. He says you shall not come into judgment. It's a promise from our Savior. It's very clear. Now, most who believe that this passage says that you can lose your salvation, they also believe you can get it back. But that's precisely what the passage says is impossible to take place. That cannot happen. That's not a possibility here. Now, if a believer falls from grace, the passage says it's impossible to renew them again to salvation, to, to repentance specifically. But that's not what any main stream Christian group teaches. They teach that if you lose your salvation, you need to get it back. But that's what Hebrews 6 says is impossible to do. If one loses their salvation, and I say if, then it's lost forever. Now, another common interpretation of the text is that some believe this is a warning to believers in name only. That those who the text is referring to who have fallen away only appeared to be believers. They were never genuine in their faith. They looked like believers, but they weren't true believers. There's probably some professors even here that, that teach that that's a common uh, understanding and a possible, certainly, understanding of the text. This position, that position that this, they appear like believers, it fits nicely in Scripture as a whole. Now, we, we've all known that there's disingenuous believers, right? Someone who professes Christ with their mouth, but at the same time, they reject Christ with their heart. Jesus told that the church would be made up of both wheat and tares, right? Of sheep and goat. We've been warned about that. Some professing Christians aren't the real deal. They're like the Jewish leaders who, who uh, were all talk and, and, and no walk, right? Jesus looked at the Pharisees at one occasion and he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're all pretty on the outside, but inside is dead men's bones. We know that some make a profession of faith, but it's not real. And sometimes they fall away. But those who fall away were never believers in the first place. It's not like they were a sheep and they suddenly became a goat. No, they were always a goat. They were always lost. They were always a spiritual poser. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or made known that none of them were of us. Now, this second interpretation, it fits well with the rest of the Bible, but I don't believe that's what the passage is teaching. And here's the main reason why. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, if you, I, I encourage you, keep your Bible open because we're going to look at a number of verses here. Verse number 4 appears to describe genuine salvation. The, the language used in verse number 4 is all over the New Testament. It's all, all over the book of Hebrews referring to genuine salvation. He says they've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've been partakers of the Holy Spirit. These are references to a genuine experience of God's grace. Now, they were given the Holy Spirit. That's a big one. That's a significant line in verse number four. The Holy Spirit's only given to the children of God. Now, the other problem with this interpretation is I don't think it actually fits with what we've observed in, in life. We've all been in churches. We understand that sometimes there are people who go through the motions of Christianity. And then at some point, God wakes them up. At some point, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of their heart and they become genuine believers. Now, if that the second interpretation is the right interpretation, it also would mean that those people who looked like believers but weren't the real deal, they could also never come to faith in Jesus Christ. It would be impossible, the text says. So what do I make of the text? Here's my interpretation. It is a common interpretation, and I, I certainly think it's the most, uh, the most appealing. That is that this is a hypothetical impossibility that's given in order to encourage believers to grow on 
and to push on to spiritual maturity. Now, the if in verse number six is a hypothetical if. He says it's impossible if, hypothetically. We see that when we, we see this interpretation, I think when we step back and get the whole context. Now, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish believers, right? Hence the book, the name of the book, Hebrews. It's written to Hebrew Christians. It's written to Jews who had experienced the grace of God through faith in Jesus, but had remained baby Christians. Now, apparently there was a growing fear among uh, that Jewish Christians were going to return to Judaism, maybe as persecution was rising. And so there's two basic themes of the book. The first theme is don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back. The second theme is press on in spiritual maturity. The first, he says, don't go back to Judaism. Why? Because Jesus is better than Judaism. Jesus is superior. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the angels. He says he's better than, than Moses and, and Joshua and Aaron. Jesus is even better than the sacrificial system. Then in chapter 5, he brings up an obscure character from the Old Testament. Now, we probably would not even pay attention to this character if not for Hebrews chapter 5. He brings up Melchizedek. Now, I want to read Hebrews chapter 5. If you flip over in your Bible a page or so, verse number 9, it says, And having been perfected, he, referring to Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation to all who believe, uh, to, to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Then he says, of whom I have much to say and hard to explain. And he tells us why. Since you have become dull of hearing. Now, who's Melchizedek? Melchizedek is a priest who Abraham encounters in Genesis chapter 14. He's a priestly king. The author of Hebrews is explaining how Jesus, who's a son of Judah and not a son of Levi, is actually, he's not a Levitical priest. He's a priest according to Melchizedek. Now, when you read Genesis, Melchizedek just kind of shows up, right? There's no genealogy given. There's no ancestors given. He has no recorded beginning, and he has no recorded end, which makes him a type of Christ. And some believe he's actually the pre-incarnate uh, son of God, a Christophany. Now, the author of Hebrews is introducing him, and he has a lot to say. He's going to go on in chapter 7 to say some more. But he pauses, and he says, it's hard to teach you about Melchizedek. Because you've become dull of hearing. He says, you don't listen very well. You've stopped being hungry for the meaty truths of Scripture. Now, remember, there's two major themes in Hebrews. Don't go back to Judaism. Jesus is better. But now you need to press forward in spiritual maturity. But they weren't pressing forward. We see that in chapter 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes uh, only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, but he's a babe. So he says, you're, you should be teachers by now, but you're needing to be uh, bottle fed. You're still a baby Christian. You're a bunch of baby Christians. Now, in John chapter 3, a man by the name of Nicodemus, a Pharisee, comes to Jesus by night. He has this wonderful encounter with our Lord. And in the midst of the conversation, Jesus tells him, he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And Nicodemus is kind of taken back by that. He has some questions. He's kind of confused. But what Jesus was referring to is you need to be born spiritually. You need to have a spiritual birth. You see, when a person places faith in Jesus Christ, their spirit comes to life. The Holy Spirit brings new life. The person's spirit, which was dead, is brought to life. And they become, at that point, a baby Christian. And just like physical babies ought to be growing, spiritual babies ought to be growing as well. Now, my wife and I uh, have four kids, and uh, we have on our hallway... We have a place where we measure the kids each year on their birthday. In fact, Monday was my oldest's uh, birthday, and we measured him that evening. And uh, it's a big deal in our family. They stand next to the wall like, you know, I'm like, you're, you haven't grown in a week. It was a week since we measured you. You, you. you haven't grown yet. But why are they doing that? Because they want to grow. It's natural for them to have a desire to grow. And 
If we measure one year, let's say one of our kids, and they had not grown for a whole year, we'd know there's a problem, right? Because it's natural for a child to grow. In the same way, it's natural for Christians to grow. The Hebrew Christians, they, they had stopped growing. They were still being bottle fed. They were still being nursed by milk. And so the author of Hebrews, is, he kind of goes off on the importance of moving forward in our faith to not keep returning to the milk. At some point, we have to grow up so that we can eat solid food, the meaty truth of God's word. That's the context of Hebrews chapter 6. Now I want to read beginning of verse number 1 of chapter 6. Therefore, he's building on what he said, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. That's the milk he's been talking about. Let us go on to perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith towards God and of the doctrine of baptisms or, or washings, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. What is the author saying here? I believe he's saying, let's move beyond the ABCs of salvation. Let's grow up. You need to mature. You don't need to lay again the foundation of repentance and faith and, and resurrection and eternal judgment. Those are foundational. Now, they're critical. They're critical, but there's more. And, and, and there's, there's a reason. For some reason, you don't want more. You're content to remain like nursing babies. Now, here's what I believe the point of this difficult passage is. The point is, you're spiritually immature, so grow up. Don't lay again the foundation because the foundation's already been laid. How, isn't that what he said? The beginning of chapter 6, it's already been laid. The answer for you is not to get saved again because you can't get saved again. It's impossible. Isn't that what the text says? It says it's impossible. Verse number four, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good works of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away. I think that's a hypothetical if. This whole situation is hypothetical. If they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. And he tells us why. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. He is saying the answer for you, your solution to your spiritual infancy isn't to get saved again. Because if you had lost your salvation, it's impossible to regain it. It's impossible to get saved again. Why? Because Jesus would have to be crucified again. The first time apparently wouldn't have been enough. It wouldn't have been sufficient. It wouldn't have fully accomplished what Jesus set out to accomplish. And that is an absolute absurdity. So that's the point. The cross is sufficient. You place your faith in Christ, you receive everlasting life, just like Jesus promised we would. You see, we cannot be born again, again. That's impossible, he says. You can't be born again, again. Because when Christ changes our nature and he transforms our life, he continues it. He brings eternal life to us. He, doesn't, he brings life that's guaranteed. It's like Jesus when he talked to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He says, I offer you water where you'll never thirst again. When Jesus touches a life, he touches it forever. He transforms us from the inside out. He changes us. Now, you don't need to lay the foundation of salvation. It's already been laid. It's time to build on it. It's time to grow up, to press on in our growth. Now, to strengthen my argument just a little bit, because this is a very complicated passage, and I recognize that there are good people on all sides of this, but to strengthen my argument, I want to point out some grammar. Now, I know that's a boring thing to do, but it's helpful sometimes. The author of Hebrews, he changes pronouns between verse 3 and verse 4. For most of the book, he's referring uh, to first-person plural, we and us, right? He, he's joining, he's, he's writing fellow believers. But in verse number 4, he changes to them and they. Them and they. 
He's talking hypothetical. And then verse number nine, after the, after the hypothetical impossibility, that thought he's interjected, he changes once again back to we and us. The author is interjecting a hypothetical impossibility to make a point. You can't lay the foundation again. Once it's laid, it's laid. Because if you lost your salvation, it's lost forever. We're secure in Christ. Now, He's saying you don't need to get saved again. It's time to grow up. So what's that, that, that's really, I believe, what the text means. What's the point? What's the point of it? What's the application for our lives? Because every time God speaks, he intends for us to hear, learn, but he wants us to be doers of the word. There is a point here. What is it? In a lot of ways, I believe the application is the point of the passage. He's saying grow Grow up. Some Christians never really grow that much. They, sp they, they remain spiritual infants, and it's a shame. A lot, of, a lot of believers just coast. They just kind of sit back. Uh, God's going to grow me in his time. No, 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 that's not how it works. We must pursue God. Now, we cannot be stagnant as Christians. You're either progressing and moving forward, or you're regressing and moving back or backwards. It's impossible to stay still. It's kind of like water. Water is, is, you can drink water when it's moving, right? It stays fresh. But the moment water stands still, it gets all those little zooplankton, tiny little tadpole creatures, it starts to smell, it's nasty, right? You don't want that water. In the same way as a Christian, if you try to just remain neutral, you're going to grow uh, nasty. It's going to be a problem. It is not going to be what God intends for you. So the application relates to growth today. Number one, we should be growing in knowledge of God and his word. We should be growing in knowledge. Now, there's some preachers every Sunday who only preach about being saved. And I hope and I pray earnestly that many people are saved through their ministry. But over the long haul in that congregation, they're going to be milk fed. And they're going to hit a point of growth and they're going to stall out. You see, a preacher's responsibility, our responsibility is to teach to impart truth, to divide faithfully the word of God. Now, Paul told the Ephesian elders there in the book of Acts, he says, I did not shy away from you from preaching the whole counsel of God. Why? Because God has no wasted words. God has no wasted words. It's all important for our maturity in order for us to grow. Now, there's two costly errors when we think about growing in biblical knowledge. Some falsely believe that, that Christianity is all of the mind. And, and it's, it's tempting sometimes to gravitate uh, to that. That heart and emotions uh, and affections are, are, are somehow dismissed as being less than Christianity. And if that is your error, it's going to lead to pride and vain religion. Now the other error relates to falsely believing that Christianity is all the heart. That, that somehow the mind dulls and suppresses the work of the Spirit and makes Christianity only about knowledge. Both of those errors are destructive. The author of Hebrews is saying, I want to teach you. I want to impart more knowledge to you. I want to teach you about Melchizedek. But you're bored. You have dull ears. You have itching ears, Paul would say. You don't want to learn about God and His plan. God wants to progress you. He wants you to learn more about him. And there's a lot of ways we learn more about God. And it certainly includes the mind, right? In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is being grilled, headed towards his trial. Just before, it's before his trial, but he's being grilled. And he's asked a question. He says, what's the greatest commandment in all the word of God? And he responds in verse 37. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. And what? with all of your mind. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, he, said, your, he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. So much of our spiritual battle and growth takes place in the mind. Now, the second point of application is we should be growing in faith, love, love. And obedience. It's not just about knowledge, is it? In fact, when judgment day comes, we will not, we will not be judged based on our knowledge. How many Bible verses we learned, our 
be able to theologically discern certain things. No, no, no. We're going to be judged on our fruit. How did we respond to the Spirit of God in our lives? Did we yield to Him as He worked? The Spirit of God, uh, He's who produces fruit in our lives, right? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Our fruit should be growing. Now, I should have more love and more patience and more faith today than I did last year. I should have more love and more faith and more patience and more obedience a year from now than I do today. That's the natural process of Christian maturity. One of the main ways the Spirit grows us, though, is by taking in His Word, to consume it. It's not like we should just read and hear God's Word, right? We must internalize it. Sometimes people need to slow down. Some people are checking off the box to do their Bible reading. No, we need to prayerfully go through our Word. The Spirit of God is speaking through His Word. It's alive. It's active. Richard Baxter, the well-known Puritan pastor, wrote about how Christians should receive preaching. Uh, So it's really to you. You're, You're receiving preaching. You're hearing God's Word taught. How should you receive it? Well, this is what he says. He says, make it your work with diligence to apply the word as you're hearing it. Cast not all upon the minister as those who will go no further than what they are carried by force. You have work to do as well as the preacher, and you should all the time be as busy as he. You must open your mouths, he's talking spiritually, and digest it, for another cannot digest it for you. Therefore, be all the while at work and abhor an idle heart in hearing. We must internalize God's word. Now, the last point of application is we should grow in the security of our salvation. In a lot of ways, I I believe that's the point of the passage. It's the opposite of being insecure in your salvation that I might lose it. No, no, no. The point is you are secure in Christ. Allow that truth to prompt you in spiritual growth. Our salvation is dependent on God. It's not dependent on us, and I thank God for that because, you know what, we would mess it up in a heartbeat. And that's, that's one of the most comforting truths I know of in my life, that I'm held by the Father. My dad tells about how he grew up in the Nazarene church. My dad's the pastor of the, the church I'm on staff at, and he tells about how he grew up in the Nazarene church that believed you could lose your salvation and then get it back. He tells about how he was a little boy, how every Sunday he was trying to get saved again. Because every week he lost it. Every week he knew, man, I've lost my salvation. I need to get saved again. That's not how God wants his children to live. Scared, insecure, unsure, relying on their own goodness to keep what God has forever accomplished for them. The work of Christ is sure. It is sufficient. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And when our kids were younger, we had four kids really close to one another. So uh, if we were in a parking lot, we, we each grabbed a hand of one of our kids. And I can remember very, uh, very well that some of our kids were a little more rebellious than others. And some of them would try to bolt, right? They see something shiny, a shiny object. They try to pick it up off the ground, and they lunge, and they let go of my hand. But it's dangerous in the parking lot, right? So they let go, trying to get away from me. Do I let go? No. There's nothing that's going to let me let go. There's nothing that would happen for me to let go of their hand. In fact, I remember one of our kids was very bad about doing this. They would like just drop, drop like, a, a, like a wet noodle, lift their, hand, their feet up off the ground, and they're just dangling there, and they let go. If I let go, they would fall on the asphalt. But you know what? The father in me did not allow me to let go. We are not held by our own grip. We are held by the grip of our gracious father. The author of Hebrews concludes the chapter in verse number 19. He says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever 
according to the order of Melchizedek. We are secure in Christ because Christ is forever our great high priest. I hope that's comforting to you like it is me. Uh, that's, that's the best news in all the world. I wake up not, not unsure of myself. I wake up knowing I am a child of God and he'll never let go of me. There's nothing I can do for God to stop loving me. There's nothing I can do for God's eternal life to be canceled. I have four kids and uh, they're in grade school and middle school at this point. And there may be a point in our relationship where they break my heart. There may be a point, and I pray it never happens, that, that they walk away from the faith. Not all of them have trusted uh, the Lord yet or expressed that as our youngest. I don't know what the future holds. But no matter what they do, no matter what they do, they'll never stop being my child. Because they'll forever be my child. Their sin, their breaking my heart, whatever that might be in the future, and I, I pray it doesn't happen. I know it'll happen a little bit, but whatever it is, it may damage our relationship. It may change our relationship. It won't break fellowship in a sense. Our sin can break fellowship. Confession is such a sweet thing because it restores. But there's nothing my kids can ever do to not be my children. There's nothing we can ever do for us not to be God's children. Why? Because we didn't become God's children by our own doing. We became his child when we trusted our Savior. Now, the author of Hebrews, to wrap it up, is telling us we're secure in Christ. So blossom. Grow. Don't stay on the milk. Don't, don't, don't be content there. Get to the meaty truths of God. And it's not just about knowledge. I, I truly believe it's about fruit, spiritual fruit. It's not time to get saved again. It's time to grow up. So let's press on in our maturity in Christ who holds us secure. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege and the honor to preach your word. Lord, it's such an unusual setting um, to be at a chapel, and I've never preached at a seminary before, and not, not my own people in terms of those that I care for as a shepherd. Lord, um, but I trust that your spirit was at work, I trust that uh, your word uh, will not return void. Lord, I pray that right now that, that whatever I said, Lord, that uh, uh, was maybe not the, the, the exact right thing to say, Lord, I, think, I pray those things would be forgotten. <laughs> and I pray, Lord, that the main truth behind your word today that we read, Lord, that those would be amplified. Lord, thank you for holding us. Thank you that it's impossible for us to lose our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the motivation you've given me this week as I've dove into your word and been encouraged by it. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Lord, I pray that uh, if there's anyone here that needs to be convicted, maybe they're, they're remaining... Uh, as uh, spiritual infants, even at a seminary. Maybe they're focused all on the knowledge side of things and they're not yielding to your spirit to allow you to produce love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and all, all those wonderful goodies, Lord, that you provide, not by our own work and effort, but by yielding to you. Lord, I pray if there's someone like that, that you would just tug on their heart, wake them up, Lord, allow them to grow. We love you. We pray that you continue to work the remainder of our time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.